The path to mastery leads through the heart of adversity. Challenge is the raw material from which courage and strength are forged. Warriors are not defined by events. Warriors define them. Warriors conquer themselves before all else. Warriors are relentless in their service to others. Join us as we open our hearts and hone our minds to a razor's edge. It doesn't matter how slow you go, only that you do not stop. Your time is now. And now your host, Jason McKenzie. Hey everybody, welcome to one of the final episodes actually of the Mental Health Warriors podcast as we uh, pivot and move in a different direction, which I am uh, really, really excited about. But regardless, this episode, I actually filmed this a while ago. I kind of suck at this sometimes. This is an opportunity for improvement. Like I, I filmed this, recorded this quite a while ago. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I'm. it was a really interesting conversation because it really drove home to me that just how unique each of our own experiences is. So uh, this conversation is with a, uh, a woman named Christine Taylor. And man, what a crazy fucking story. Like we're talking PTSD, depression, anxiety disorder, and like it, just a lifetime, like, you know, er, early trauma and just a lifetime of uh, just uh, almost victimization at the hands of the mental health system. And she was a very highly educated uh, senior nurse, and uh, but regardless, um, just uh, just a horrific, horrific experience of uh, nonstop, you know, cycling through the mental health system, and you know, just all the shit, basically. And how she started her healing journey actually was her psychiatrist, who was also a shaman. Uh, recommended her to a shaman. And I've talked about this so many times, you know, because that was actually what started her path to healing. And you might dismiss that and you say, oh, that's fucking bullshit or whatever. But, you know, it worked for her. And the reason it worked, does it even really matter, right? Obviously, it was the right person at the right time saying and doing the right things that is what she needed in that moment. And she considers herself healed now. And I mean, this is after a lifetime of just pain and misery, right? So um, she's actually written a book called, And Then There Was Light, My Journey Through Mental Illness. And um, it's really quite an interesting tale. And what's, again, I, I encourage you to open your mind because for her, this worked. And I think what's really important is as we, for people that are struggling, like, fuck, you got to open your mind and be open to like trying anything, not just following any kind of dogma, you know, whether it's medical dogma or, or any specific, you know, methodology, you need to understand you and understand what works for you. And if something's not working, keep learning and keep researching. And I, I know how challenging that is, obviously, if you're in the middle of like, if you're in the shit, but regardless, you know, there's an infinite, infinite path to healing. And, you know, maybe it's not one thing, maybe it's a combination of a bunch of different things. And it just can, takes continual trial and error. But what I'm saying is, you know, open your mind, open your heart and real, listen to Christine's story. And, you know, you may dismiss her as someone who's fucking crazy, like, oh my God, she got healed by a shaman. But when you talk to her, she's the most eminently reasonable, educated person you could deal with um, or talk to. So I found this episode fascinating. And I think you will too. So listen to it and uh, love your feedback. And if you uh, want to help out the show, couple things. Leave a review on iTunes. That would be amazing. Um, also, if you support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash mental health warriors, that would be greatly appreciated. It does cost money to host a podcast. And I'm actually like almost breaking even now, but we could do even more things uh, with more support. And that's cheap. It's like literally a dollar an episode. Of, you know, this would be like four bucks a month, four dollars a month. And lastly, I'll say, um, if you're if you're a guy and you're looking for a tribe, like you feel alone, you feel like people don't understand, you feel like there's something missing in your life, check out the Dad Edge Alliance or just reach out to me and ask me about it. Find me on Facebook, ask me about it. I just got back from a summit in St. Louis where 70, roughly 70 guys came together um, 
from the Dad Edge, mostly from the Dad Edge Alliance, and I have never seen a more. I'm, and I'm this is not hyperbole in the slightest, but I have never experienced a more transformative, uplifting, powerful event in my entire life. We had seventy guys there. Uh, I, I'm been telling people it's i'm probably underestimating i bet you there was two thousand hugs there was tears tons of tears uh as men connected with their deepest values and and imagine their most evocative images of the future but most importantly there was just only love and support and encouragement and i'm telling you when you have that in your life your life is better so if you're a dude who's operating under the you know under the I guess the from the perspective that you're a fucking badass and you don't need you know you're just gonna go talk shit with your buddies and you don't need uh, you know emotional connection with other men. Fuck you. That's what I say to you. Okay. Open like again. Open your mind. I'm telling you, I was you. If you're like that, fuck, I was you. And uh, this way is a thousand times better. So um, I'll leave a link in the show notes page of Dad Edge Alliance. But seriously, reach out, ask me about it. It's a game changer. Game changer. It is literally the easiest way to just get instant access to a vastly higher caliber of person in your life. Boom. Just like that. And there is literally no better investment of time, money, and energy than getting yourself around a a group of people who are living their core values and are striving for more and supporting each other and, you know, working on their own shit, owning their own shit. So, Dad Edge Alliance, seriously, talk to me about it. It's one of my favorite subjects to talk about. And I will stop rambling with that. And now, on to the show. Christine, welcome to the Mental Health Warriors podcast. Thank you. It's nice yeah, it's to great. Here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And I, I mean, I'm so looking forward to hearing your story because it's just so interesting what you've been through and, and what you've turned it into and writing a book and I always love talking to people who've taken their greatest, you know, struggle and challenge or source of shame or difficulty and turned it into the source of their greatest contribution. I find that it's just such a liberating thing for people. And I get very inspired by talking to people who've done that. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So maybe you could start where probably back at the beginning and and just walk us through your journey and and where you started from and, and how you got to the point you're at today. Okay. Um, Initially, I thought I, I grew up in a very functional family, but it turned out to be very dysfunctional, whereby I was abused by my father physically, mentally, emotionally. My mother was a perfectionist, and um, <clears throat> they had great skirmishes, and unfortunately, I sided with my mother. Not that that was a bad thing, but it was not necessarily the best thing for me, Um And uh, I became uh, also a victim of abuse because I was with my mother, so to speak. We lived in the same house, all of us, but it was it was a very dysfunctional house. Um, So also as a little kid, I had dyslexia and wasn't able to really read or write until about the sixth grade. So that was a disadvantage as a student in school. As you can imagine, you're not necessarily one of the group um, when you can't do those things. Um, As I grew up, I kind of immersed myself into um, activities, school activities, and um, became a costume mistress, made thousands of costumes and for school plays and outside community plays. And then when I went to college, um, the bottom fell out um, emotionally. So can I can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Um, one, you mentioned at the beginning that you 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 thought you grew up in a, a functional home, mm-hmm. but you were really in a, a very dysfunctional home. What happened to? I guess my two questions: Did you think you were in a functional home because you didn't know anything different? And then what what happened that made you realize that maybe it was not so functional after all? Right. Um, About the age of nine, my mother and father both decided to go to work. And uh, my father had always worked. Um, It was a traditional 1950s family where the mom stayed home and the father worked. My mother also went to work. Um, My father wasn't making uh, enough money, um, although he worked hard. There was no question about it. But um, the functionality of the family um, became clearer as I got older. 
um, because they were constantly fighting. They were just constantly fighting verbally and it became physical. And part of the problem was my father had another relationship and my mother knew this and my father was in denial of this. So as you can imagine, that that causes um, stress in any family where that sort of thing occurs. Um, also, in terms of functionality, abusing your children is not the right way to go uh, physically or mentally or emotionally. Um, but that's what happened. And so I realized this, not when I was a kid, but when I was an adult, about 39 years old. Hmm. So how did the, your mom's perfectionism, I guess, play out in your life? Yes, I wanted, I always wanted to do the very best that I could do, which is not a bad attribute. Um, but um, it gets in your way when you don't succeed. Uh, you don't. You, you think you can do better than than you actually can, and um, you know it was like I had to toe the mark all the time in the house um, in terms of being like a mother, so to speak, because I was taking care of the household chores and that sort of thing, and I was going to school as a child. And I was immersed in activities. And when I went to college, as I said, the bottom fell out. I had had straight A's going into my finals. But when the bottom fell out, when I became very depressed over God knows what, because I wasn't aware of what the trigger was at that time, I uh, basically blew all my final exams. And the only thing that I did well on was a paper that I had written. Um, so I was terribly distressed by the fact that I ended up with C's that marking period in college and literally, uh, decided to change my major at that point. So was your, and was your mom from, from her perspective, like, was she very demanding that you yes. be perfect? Okay. Yes. Yes, she was. She was very demanding. And was yeah. it about specific? Was it about specific things, or really just about everything? Everything, everything you did, everything, everything had to be just so all the time. And was your? You mentioned that you went into you went through a phase where you made costumes in high school, and you made thousands mm -hmm. of costumes. Was that a result of what you had experienced at home somehow? Like, was that an escape, or was that just something you were very passionate about? It was an escape. It was. I like to sew. I got into making costumes by default um, simply because I played the viola and the, the person who was making costumes also played the viola. So he asked me if I could sew and I, I mistakenly said yes. <laughs> but um, yes, I made <clears throat> lots and lots and lots of costumes and um, it was it was escape. Yeah. And there were no boundaries either in the sense that not only did I make costumes for school, but then I did it for community theater too. Hmm. So it really, and then I'm assuming your perfectionist tendencies obviously probably made that even more all consuming than it already was. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Interesting. So when you're, you're in college now and you say the bottom fell out, was it something that had been building or, or was it just uh, something triggered you and, and really it was, you know, uh, some, something that happened really quickly? It, it, it happened. Some something happened quickly. I have no memory of what might have happened or why it happened, but all of a sudden I couldn't study anymore. Nothing was proce being processed, um, and uh, like I said, I I was so proud of myself that I had been getting like A's in German and organic chemistry and English. I had been getting straight A's and like. That that was uh, you know very hopeful, but um, I don't know what happened. Um, I don't know if it was accumulation of stresses from the childhood stage, or was my perfectionism at work, or what it was uh, exactly. But I do remember being very angry at God because I said this is not right. I'm a good person. I've helped people all my life, and um, why are you allowing this to happen to me? There, there seemingly was no explanation for it. I just had this 
slight triggering when you talked about organic chemistry back to when I was in college and I got cold sweats. So I definitely did not have an A in organic chemistry. <laughs> let's put it that way. So, so, um, so you're now you're, you've not done well in your, your exams, you're in the midst of a depression. So what happens next? Well, um, I changed my major from pre-med and nursing to, um, elementary education. And it was said that it was said, not necessarily true, those who can't do teach. And I thought, well, I'm going to change it to the e easiest um, track that I'm aware of. Now, you have to understand, I love to teach. I really do. Um, but um, I didn't do well there either. <laughs> oh, really? No, I didn't do really well. I got some B's and C's and um, that was not acceptable to me. Eventually, I did really well. Eventually, I went back to college to get my degree in nursing after I got my degree in elementary education. Eventually, I came out with uh, being on the National Honor Society uh, for nursing. Uh, but um, initially, all the all my plans just blew up in front of me. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a smooth sailing. And so were you aware at that time of uh, like any, any connection to your past? So, I mean, you, you graduate, uh, you still got good enough marks to graduate for, from with the teaching degree. So, I mean, what happens at that point after that? I mean, are you still in the grips of depression? Are you understanding that, that there's some connection to your past or you just have no idea what's happening to you? Right. Um, I have uh, no idea why it, is, it was the way it was. Um, I was just kind of going through the motions of life and um, trying to take it one day at a time. But again, I would, there was such anger at God um, that I kind of separated myself from him in a certain sense. Um, and I just, I just kept plowing through because that's my nature is to plow through. And so did you, did you continue to, I mean, I guess Mike, how did, how did that evolve for you? So did you sink lower or did you, I mean, I know you've been, you, you had a period where you were diagnosed with a number of different things. So like, mm -hmm. how did that play out? Right yeah. Now? Um, eventually after about a year or two, um, the depression started to ease up. I was not treated. I had no therapy, nothing. Um, and sometimes that happens that depression will relinquish its, its, uh, hands, so to speak. Um, and eventually some of it subsided. And I, I guess part of it was that I began to get more self-confidence when I began to get better grades, which I guess is consistent with the perfectionism in a certain sense. And, um, yeah. I, and like I said, I eventually I graduated with honors in nursing. I was very happy with myself, but I, I never returned to the church at that point in time. Um, um, I just, I just kept going on, but I wasn't really a happy person. I was just, uh, going along <laughs> for the ride, so to speak, trying to help other people and found pleasure in helping other people as a nurse. And so, okay. So, and then from that point, I guess, I guess, how did you, how did you know you wanted to be, become a nurse? Well, my dream was to become a doctor. Right. And when I bombed out of organic chemistry and all the the math and the science, all the sciences during my sophomore year, I decided that um, I couldn't be a doctor, that nobody would take me with my grades. Um, so, like I said, I changed to elementary education, got my first job in elementary education. It was a horrific job. Um, it's described in the book and, um, I decided it was an, I had graduated in December from school and got my first job in January. A teacher had left, uh, the classroom one day, just up and left the classroom after 15 years of teaching in this particular school district. And, um, they were looking for a replacement for her. And they, the kids had like 24 substitutes. So I walked into a landmine, you might say. Um, it was very dis dis uh, dysfunctional <laughs> in a sense. I, pic 
I'm picturing something out of like a movie where the the teacher walks in and there's like complete chaos in a classroom. It's spitballs being thrown all over the place. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. And besides that, they had no, they had no textbooks and uh, the textbooks that they did have were from the 1940s and this is 1972 and they didn't have the same edition of the same textbook. And I would make up my own at those times dittos that were in or now you might call them Xeroxes. But um, I would make up my own uh, papers so the kids could do their work. And um, the the school said I was using too much paper. So it was like a no win situation. Um, that particular year, about 11 Hundred students were projected to leave the district between the graduating class and people who were moving out of the area. And so 11 of us teachers were let go. And I, being the last hired, was the first to, to be let go. Um, they wanted me to come back as a special ed teacher. And I never had a special ed course. So, um, and thankfully, thankfully, I had um, some money. Um, left to me by my grandfather who had died, and I went back to school to become a nurse. So um, I figured that, you know, that was pretty good. My my plan originally was to become a nurse so I could work my way through medical school, which is kind of um, – not not done. I mean, you can't you can't really work much when you're in medical school. Right, right. No kidding. So did that did that experience as as a teacher in that environment? And again, thinking I'm just thinking about your uh, perfectionist tendencies. I mean, did you feel like you were failing all the time, or did you understand that it was a no, uh, you know, a situation where pretty much nobody could be successful? Right. Uh, the latter. I oh, okay. thought it was a situation that nobody could be successful in. Um, it was. It was just a terrible situation. <laughs> wow. I can't. I can't even imagine. So you become a nurse. Mm -hmm. Now, have you been? Have you been diagnosed with anything at this point? No. Like offic officially. Okay. So. You, but, you, but, you... but 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 hold on. Uh, when okay. I, I took um, one of the courses that I had to take as a nurse was psychiatric nursing. You know, you get a plethora of, of different courses and then you kind of specialize, just like doctors tend to specialize. And um, my uh, professor at that time, you know, we had very small groups, like six of us in the same group. And we would meet every couple times a week and so on and so forth. We would go to the state mental hospital. And she said to me, you have a very poor self-concept Hmm. Okay. And she says, you really need some therapy. Well, my insurance would only cover three sessions. And um, I didn't have any, I didn't have any family support in terms of financial support. And I didn't have the money to see a therapist on my own. So I saw a therapist and he says, you need to read the book um, by Greenwald, be the person you were meant to be. Okay. So what, ca what caused her to say that you had a poor self-concept? I, that's a that's a very good question. Her insight as a, a psychiatric nurse must have realized that I was not uh, confident about what I was doing. Okay. So you read the so uh, you read the book. Mm -hmm. and I'm I, assuming it resonated with you deeply. It, it did. It did. And I tried to um, I tried to implement. Uh, that strategy of trying to be um, just the person I was meant to be. But um, uh, I also had a friend at that time who had com uh, tried to commit suicide. And that really impacted me more than I realized. Um, but I had never been diagnosed until I was 39 years old. When when everything came to roost, all of my past came to roost. I also had a family at that time. Uh, my husband had been sick most of our married life and died at an early age. My children, um, my one son is schizophrenic, and that was very uh, difficult to deal with. Um, so uh, there were many things that kind of just unfolded and that I had stuffed down over time and they came out and 
uh, all of a sudden I started with severe, severe headaches for about six months and they were, they tried to treat them. Nothing was responding. They hospitalized me in those days. They would do that a little bit more frequently than they do today. Um, did a CAT scan. Everything came out negative. The psychiatrist walked into the room and I, and I was kind of resting and I said, Oh, I'm sorry. And he says, you have, you are an abused person and you have depression. Never said any other word to me before that. <laughs> Never met him before. And I was like, okay, how do you know this? And, um, and then I was discharged and I tried to get up for work a few days later. I was discharged like on a Friday and tried to get up and go back to work on Monday. And I couldn't move. I could not move. I don't know if what the doctor said had resonated so much within me, um, but I still didn't understand what was going on. I, I just did not understand it. Um, you may think uh, as a nurse that you would understand depression, but um, it just, like I said, it didn't resonate inside of me because I was a nurse. This doesn't happen to nurses, right? Things don't happen to nurses. That's not the case. That's not life. That's not real life. And um, it wasn't until I was 39 that um, I was hospitalized because the depression had turned to severe suicidal ideations. And that's when they hospitalized me. Wow. Is it, you know, I've talked to some other nurses and it sounds, I don't know if it's still the case. I get the impression that it might be, but that's, is that a common belief among nurses? <laughs> That, I think so. Yeah, interesting. Because it sounds like it's a. It sounds like it can be a pretty competitive environment too. I guess maybe it depends where you work or, or the type of nursing that you're doing. But some of the nurses I've talked to and and where they were at in the hospitals they were at, it can be very very competitive. Yes, they don't want to show weakness. Right, right, exactly. And I I tried to work through all that. I try. I worked years with all of that stuff down in me. But uh, and I did a really good job. I mean, I was like an administrator and. I did a lot of things in nursing. I opened up the first oncology unit in the community hospital. I was the head nurse of that. I organized, I organized uh, all the nurses in the sense of getting them up to speed on some educational th thinking at the time uh, regarding different types of tumors, how to do chemotherapy, you know, all of those different venues that uh, cancer patients uh, encounter. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I did some relatively remarkable things in those, in those days, in spite of all of the depression and in spite of how I was. However, once I was out of the hospital after three months, I was not able to go back to work for about five years. Wow. So when you, when you are having these suicidal ideations, are you, I mean, are you, I'm curious, I always ask this question because my first, my first wife took her own life, um, oh, as a result sorry. of. Yeah, she was she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but I no longer believe that's the case at all. I, I'm sure she was either borderline personality disorder or you know, or some form of complex post traumatic stress or both. But what I, I always ask because I'm there's a part of me because of my story that really it, there's always this curiosity about what people's state of mind is is when they're in that state, right? What are they thinking? And so for you, what when you're having these suicidal ideations, I mean, what are the thoughts that are going through your head? Are, are you feeling like a failure? Are you wanting to end your pain? Are you wanting to free people from the burden you think you are? Or is it some combination of all of those things? Yes. Yes. I think it is a combination of most of those things. For me, it was a continuous tape of, you may say that it was, it was psychotic, but it was a continuous tape going in my head, just kill yourself, just kill yourself, just kill yourself, just kill yourself. Just kill yourself. And um, because you want to, you, I wanted to escape the pain of the depression because it was, it was overwhelming and it was really living day by day and um, hanging on to dear life. It became a joke with one of my therapists. How many fingers are you hanging on with today? And uh, you know, you know, one, two, and uh 
yeah, it's 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 very discouraging to go through that depression, and it's very hard to go through depression. It's it, you're and I was incredibly sad, um, felt like a failure, just wanted to get off the merry-go-round. Um, I didn't want to live anymore. So you were hospitalized, and mm -hmm. what happens when you're in the hospital? I mean, what kind of I guess intervention? I know with my first. Uh, with Cindy, my first wife, they, she was hospitalized at one point for depression and it was, it was horrible. God, they, she got electroshock therapy or ECT. And uh, I mean, it was, it was just a, uh, I don't know. It felt like something out of a movie. I'll never forget the, you know, taking her to the locked ward. They actually took her shoelaces, you know, I'll never forget the sound of the, the, that metal door closing as a, you know, I don't know. We were like literally feet apart, but it felt like we were worlds apart. And, um, you know, when she got the electro ECT, I mean, she obviously it, it wiped out her short term memory and it was it was just like something out of it felt like something out of a horror movie. But it, on the flip side, it was at least she was safe. Yes, that's true. And I felt totally humiliated when I went into the hospital. Me, a nurse, having been somewhat accomplished, um, going through the lock ward, hearing that door lock behind me. Um, Getting strip search was one of the most humiliating things that happened. Um, plus, I uh, they had me on Wellbutrin at that time, which caused uh, Prozac, excuse me, Prozac. And for me, that caused urinary retention. And so I had catheterized myself. And then, you know, you have to catheterize yourself in front of somebody else. I mean, it was just the most humiliating experience. However, it was... Um, what was transparent was that I had been abused and that came out as in therapy classes. There were some very good classes there, um, art classes. We had to draw different things and, um, and, uh, the, the group therapy classes revealed to me that I had been abused and never did I realize this before. Never did I realize that I had been sexually abused as well as physically and mentally abused. Um, it, it, it never, it never came to the surface. And not that I necessarily dealt with it there, but, um, those revelations came to be. What was frustrating was that three months after I was in the hospital, um, I was discharged. And uh, the only thing that had changed were the suicidal ideations. I was no longer suicidal. But none of the medications worked for me. And they tried me on almost every form of medication at that time. And that was very upsetting. Um, I didn't know how I was going to go through life, um, uh, you know, feeling so badly all the time. And they proposed ECT for me, which I said, no way, Jose. I thought it was bar barbaric. Um, eventually, a year later, I had ECT, and it helped me within three treatments. However, I lost not only short-term memory, I lost my long-term memory. And that's why I could not go back to work, um, because I had lost so much of my nursing understanding and knowledge. Wow. And and I had lost things like my husband would say to me, you're fun taking you out to different places. You don't remember that you've been here. Well, maybe funny to him, but it wasn't funny to me. And, um, I, you know, I would read and read and read and read. And I would say, oh, I remember that word, you know, which had completely escaped my vocabulary. Um, there were so many side effects to the ECT. And I had it again and again and again and again. And uh, they tried to give me some medicine to prevent um, prevent the memory loss. But the bottom line was the ECT wasn't helping. So, so God, that's – I can't uh, – just, just the, I mean, aside from everything else, I can't imagine how devastating that must have been to lose the ability to – be a nurse and to yeah. lose that knowledge that you had worked so hard to accumulate. Right. Right. That's why I continually read. So I could reaffirm 
those things or try to regenerate in my mind the different things that I had learned over time. And so, so the ECT doesn't work and you've, you know, you've had it, as you said, multiple times. And I, I, there's part of me that's surprised that you're not suicidal again at this time, because I mean, I can't, you must've been in just such a place of despair and, and not, I mean, not having anything to look forward to. I mean, and feeling like, and I know Cindy went through this too, which is, you know, nothing is working, you know? Right. And, and for her, it was, and, it may, and maybe, well, this is the same for you. You alluded to the abuse and all that, but she, you know, she never really confronted or dealt with the trauma she experienced as a child, the, the terrible, you know, sexual abuse and all that stuff. And so, you know, she was really just, I mean, it was putting lipstick on a pig almost, you know, like it was mm -hmm. never the thing, the, the medication was never the thing that was going to help her heal from the trauma she experienced. But so she just went through year after year after year of looking, unable to see a path towards any kind of light. Right. That's exactly why I entitled my book. And then there was light um, because it is a very dark hole. It is, um, it is when you never want to experience. And um, it's, it's, it seemed like it was going to be perpetual. And I was very blessed. Um, I, changed doctors a few times and found a doctor who helped me get kind of on the right path. Um, she tried me on an SSRI, which was relatively new in the 1990s. Um, and she tried me on uh, Risperdal, which is an antipsychotic, which enabled me to sleep at least. Um, those things seem to help for make me a little more adaptable. Uh, not that my memory came back, but I had, like I said, I would read, so I would relearn. And eventually I went back and I um, was a school nurse uh, for a year, uh, which was crazy. But, but it was still, uh, I was able to function and I did well. And um, then I went back to Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia and worked as a research nurse which is what I had done earlier in my career. And at that point in time, we moved from Pennsylvania, from New Jersey, excuse me, to uh, Massachusetts. And um, then um, again, the bottom fell out later on when I was in uh, Massachusetts. And um, I think that was because my son who was schizophrenic had really just honed in on being the most destructive person he could be. Um, my husband was extremely sick and my older son was pretty much defiant. And um, I, although I had, we had a daughter too, we had adopted a daughter. Um, she was, um, if you will, the angel in the group. Um, but um, I think the coming together, the, the, the molding of all those things at, at one time again affected me so much, especially after my husband died. It was like I would function and I would go to work and I became a research nurse at Mass General Hospital and I would function and uh, did the very best I could. I immersed myself into patient issues and helped them out tremendously help my husband, you know, try to do the best for my sons. Um, and it was after my husband died, I think that I kind of crashed and burned again. It was a culmination of that. Actually, it was after that my mother got very, very sick. And um, I took care of her for a couple of years. And that was six months after my husband died. I never expected to be in that position. Um, I was still working full time, and I think just the accumulation of all the stressors um, played itself out after my mother died. In, oh, um, holy moly! I guess so. That is an incredible amount to be taking on for for anybody. So, when did were you did you end up being hospitalized again? I did four times. Four times. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I received more ECT. And then eventually my doctor said to me, um, you know, I, I said to my doctor, 
this is not working. I feel very hollow. I feel like there's nothing inside of me. I have no purpose in life. Um, and this is after years of therapy and after doing, you know, some grief counseling and everything. And it was around November. And um, <clears throat> he said to me in December, do you want to talk to a shaman? And I like looked at him like he had horns growing out of his head. Oh, this is interesting. I find this whole uh, concept really, uh, I've been really interested in it. So I can't wait to hear how this goes. Yeah. Um, he said, you want to talk to a shaman? I said, um, what do I have to lose? <laughs> you know, I had tried basically yeah. everything in the book. They had revised my diagnosis to four different diagnoses. I had tried to deal with everything. And yet I'm feeling this like shell, like a shell, an empty shell. And um, uh, so I, I tried to call the shaman and make a long story short, had the wrong phone number, um, called her and got connected with her in January. We talked on the phone for about 45 minutes, um, never saw her face to face. Um, after we had our discussion, she was very clairvoyant at the time of the conversation. My doctor had called her to tell her that I was refractory to everything. That's not a very settling kind of disposition to be in. Sorry, what, he, he called to say what? I was refractory to everything. What, I what does that would mean? Not, what that means is that I did not respond to any conventional medications, treatments, whatever. And, that, uh, and I still had this uh, immense hole in my heart, so to speak, um, so he, he, that's all he told her. He didn't tell her any, any details. And she would ask me questions like, what's going on with your neck? And I said, I just had parathyroid surgery. What's going on with your back? I said, I have spinal stenosis. And it was like, how'd she know this? You know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, she said, we, like I said, we talked for about 45 minutes. Um, she says she's going to do some work. And, um, uh, whatever that meant that time, I had no idea. And, um, she would call me back in about a few days, which she did. And she called me back on a Thursday and I began to feel very different, very, very different. And what she did, what she did is that she got rid of or with, extracted, so to speak, many discarnates in my body. Discarnates are souls without bodies. And she said that these spirits basically entered my body over a lifetime because I was very vulnerable to many things. Of course, being vulnerable, having the depression, having suicidal ideations, you know, being traumatized, so on and so forth. So, um, I went to the doctor's office the next day because I had a scheduled appointment. And he says, you look totally different. I said, I feel totally different. And he said, what happened? I says, well, it was the work of the shaman. And um, little did I know that he was a shaman too. So he really? was working on, yes, he was working on two planes, not only as a psychiatrist, but as a shaman. And so he knew what was going on with me, but didn't want to um, get involved in shamanic work with me. He wanted to source that out, which he did. And um, he he just he just knew what was going on. So and uh, it, that, that is so interesting, especially because you, I mean, being someone who not only had you know, been quote treated for so long at the hands of traditional Western medicine, but also had been so, you know, your professional life was, was exactly that, right? I mean, nursing right. in a traditional system. So when you, was, he first suggested the shaman, I mean, I guess at that point you're, I don't know how skeptical you were, but you must've been just so desperate that, I mean, you were willing to try anything at that point. That's exactly right. I had nothing to lose. I had nothing to lose. I had tried everything. <clears throat> nothing worked. 
So, um, and I worked very hard at trying to get better. You have to understand that. I did everything that doctors told me. Um, if things weren't working, I was always in communication with my doctors. I went to partial programs. I, I studied. I did everything. I journaled. I did all the things that they wanted me to do. I, uh, my doctor, that I'm referring to who recommend the shaman also recommended yoga and meditation and um, massage and different, different West uh, acupuncture, all those things I did. And some of them, you know, helped tremendously, but all of a sudden, like I said, there was this hollow feeling inside of me. And I was like, where is this coming from? What is going on now? You know, you know, this was a, a this was a different feeling than wanting to kill myself. Um, but yes, I was very skeptical. Um, the only experience I had ever had with a shaman was reading the book Eat, Pray, and Love. Um, and she talks about being going to the middle, the east, and encountering a shaman. Um, the author does, and uh, that was it. And I was like, this is amazing. This is amazing. What's going on here is amazing. So what's the path forward from you from that point? You look different. You feel different. And was it not? I'm sure the, the path forward wasn't linear, but was it a path of healing from that point forward? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Wow. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> did you continue to do work with the shaman or how did that? I did some work with the shaman uh, again over the phone. Eventually, we met face to face because I wanted to meet her. Um, and uh, yeah, a very little work um, cost me about two hundred dollars. That was it. <laughs> Far less expensive than seeing a psychiatrist. Um, but uh, she was amazing, and and she she showed me. She says you probably want to know what I do. And she, she opened up this book and she had the crystal and she says the crystal swings on its own. And it's true. It does. And she says the crystal highlights areas that based on the book, what's going on with me. And, um, she was able to do her work and, um, I have felt great ever since. This is your story is the exact reason that I want to do this podcast, you know, because when we were, in, as I said, uh, I think I was talking to somebody else before the podcast about this, but when we, when Cindy was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, it never even occurred to me to, uh, to either of us to question anything about it. It was okay. Here's the psychiatrist, you know, she's suffering terribly. You get a referral to a psychiatrist, you go to the psychiatrist, he's got all the degrees on the wall. He labels it, gives you treatment. Like it never occurred to us to, to, think about anything different. And what I, what I've realized since then is in hearing stories like yours is there is an entire universe of things that are possible that we don't consider. And it's really, I've heard this term a little while ago and I love using it, but it's like N of one healing. Like every single one of us is a unique human being. And, you know, we have to, there's so such an opportunity to, to acknowledge that, I guess, and, and develop healing journeys that are absolutely unique to us, which sounds exactly like what you finally ended up doing. Exactly. Exactly. And never in my wildest dreams would I ever conceive or think about going to a shaman. <laughs> no, I mean, why would you, right? It's that, yeah. I mean, it, it, the tr when people, I'm sure people, even people listening to this podcast, uh, hopefully not at this point, because I've had so many interesting guests on, but I'm, sh I'm sure there's people here as shaman and just think, just a snake oil salesperson. Yes, right? exactly. Exactly. And wow. uh, she was amazing. She was amazing. And I, um, and I, and you know, I, I have a very spiritual life as well. And, you know, my prayers are that uh, I thank God every day that I was introduced to this person because I think God uses people in different ways. And, uh, you know, I even went to a Catholic nun who was a uh, counselor. So uh, that's not the right word, um, but she would help people on their spiritual journey, so to speak. And I, I went to her after the shaman uh, kind of helped me get healed. 
And I said, is this, is this possible? And, um, I, you know, is, is this consistent with my Catholic upbringing? And she said, yes. She says, God uses people in different ways. So it was amazing. So, and now did you make, uh, did you make, you mentioned spirituality and I know mm -hmm. from a, from in your previous, as you're growing up, that that was primarily in the church, but did you, as you healed and, and you had this experience with the shaman, did you radically change your lifestyle to, to incorporate, I don't know, more, more spirituality or different kinds of spirituality or more peace or anything like that? I have more peace. Yes. Um, I, I, you know, pray all the time and, um, I'm very, I'm just very thankful, and I try to be a, a peaceful person, person, and um, try to help other people as much as I can. Wow! So, do you consider yourself healed at this point? Yes, I do. What a yes. what an, uh, wow! That is what a message of hope. You know, I mean, to go from that just such despair for such a long time, and to be able to move through that and into the place you are now is, is going to be inspiring to so many people, which I'm kind of assuming is what, one of the reasons you wrote the book. That's exactly why I wrote the book because I did my homework prior to writing the book and found that there was nothing written about shamans um, that I had. I went through um, Amazon and tried to read the, the information about different people and different people had tried different things, you know, like tattoos, whatever. And it made them feel better. Um, nowhere after reading 250 blurbs, did I come up with a shaman? And I thought this is something I need to share because this is another venue that people don't know about necessarily or think about. And it may not work for everybody. But for me, it worked, and I was, and I've been eternally grateful for that. So, did you, to get to the point of writing a book? I've written one myself, and I know I don't know if you. I found it to be quite the experience. It was really an emotional experience for me because not only was it a, you know, it's a project of of significant magnitude, but it's also, you know, there was a lot of reflection for me and a lot of, you know, digging deep and trying to peel back the onion to, to learn about myself and to help those, you know, to help people through that self-discovery. But how did you, did you feel like, was there a moment where you felt like I had to write the book or did you feel this like increasing need that you had this story that needed to be shared? And then, I mean, how did you get to the point of wanting to do that? Well, three people had told me that I should write a book. And that was kind of interesting. And so I decided that I would write a book. And um, I was on a yoga retreat at one point and outlined the entire book on the retreat. And um, what what I found in the process of writing the book and the reason why I wrote the book is because I thought I had a story to share that could give hope to other people. And, uh, and to enlighten people that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes down in people's lives and we need to be understanding of that and help them along in life's journey. And, um, I just wanted to make sure that people know that there's hope out there, um, especially when they're so despondent because I was incredibly despondent so much of my life. And, um, little did I know that there could be this venue of opportunity. And so if yeah, that, that actually leads into the question I wanted to ask you, and maybe you just answered it, but I'll ask it anyways, which is if you were standing in front of someone who was in the same or similar space of despair that you were at and had tried quote everything and nothing had worked and, and asked you what, should, what would you tell them? Um, I would uh, I would share with them that maybe they need to see a shaman. Um, I would you know I would I wouldn't make an initial assumption that they need to see a shaman because I think traditional medicine and and ancillary things like yoga and acupuncture and stuff like that is is also helpful. But I would I was I have I have shared with a number of people that maybe a shaman might be helpful and with those people that I have referred to my shaman, uh, they've been helped by her.
So, um, yeah, I, I would I would tell them that there is this venue, but it, it wouldn't be my first. It wouldn't be my first thing. It would be, you know it would be down the road. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's an amazing story, and I think it's going to give. I think it's just. I think your story and I'm and your book will just open people's eyes to what else is possible. The more I learn, the more I realize how little we truly understand and, and how much also how much I think of what has been lost about what we actually did know at some point and, you know, different, uh, whether it's, whether it's shamanism or whether it's Ayurveda or whether it's Chinese medicine or whatever, whether mm -hmm. it's just historical societal knowledge that we've sacrificed at the altar of science. And you know what I mean? Like it's, I right. think it's, I think your story is going to help people just open their eyes to what's possible. Yes. 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 I hope it does. I really hope it does. I hope it gives them hope. Well, Christine, thank you so much for being on the Mental Health Warriors podcast. I, uh, I mm -hmm. really enjoyed this conversation a lot. So for people that want to know more about you and the work you're doing in your book, what's the best way for them to, uh, f to learn more about you? Okay. Um, well, there's a website. It says it's C E Taylor slash um, memoir.com and um, that's a website and then there the book itself is and then there was light my journey through mental illness and that's available through Barnes and Nobles and Amazon it comes in ebook it also is available through Life Rich Publishing by the way um, which is par uh, part of Reader's Digest um, and um, it comes in ebook, it comes in hardcover and in softback. Oh, wonderful. And we'll include links to all of those, all of the things you just mentioned and anything else you want to share in the show notes page so people will have easy access to it when we publish the episode. Uh, before we sign off, is there anything else you wanted to share with the audience? No, just not to give up hope. <laughs> wonderful. Well, hey, Christine, thank you so much for being on the Mental Health Warriors podcast. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And how about that? What a story, eh? Like, can you seriously imagine going through that level of, of pain and misery and feeling like helplessness for that long? Like, holy shit. So congratulations to Christine. Congratulations on your book. And most importantly, I, I think congratulations for opening my eyes and really driving home the point that there are infinite options available and that every one of us is a unique human being and we will respond to and thrive in our own beautifully unique environment. And in order to find that, you got to keep looking, right? That's really what it's all about. So what do I want to say? I'm going to end this show like I end every show. And I won't be doing this too many more times. But uh, if you are struggling, I want you to know that I've struggled too. We've all struggled. Fuck, we've all struggled. We're, we're all still struggling with something. So own it and let other people know. Let other people know what you struggle with. God, it's what makes us human. It's not something to be ashamed about, right? So, and if you do that, you will give them the gift of safety and human connection. And when you do that, your life just gets better because you're giving someone else one of the greatest gifts one human being can give to another. So go forth and create connection.